Hi guys and welcome back to another true crime and makeup time video. If you're new here, my name is Sarah and I post a new true crime video every single week. So if you love makeup and you love true crime, definitely turn on your notifications for my channel so that you get notified of any new videos I post and leave a comment down below just saying hi or if you have any cool case suggestions. So today's case, we are going back to South Africa with my friends and I don't know why I keep like coming across these cases that happen in South Africa, but there's a lot of them. This case involves a man and a woman, Annie Diwani and Shreyan Diwani, and they get married in this beautiful, lavish, opulent ceremony. And then they go on their honeymoon and that's where everything goes wrong. So let's get into today's case. Now, Annie Hindocha, that's her maiden name. She came from the Hindocha family, duh. And she was born in Sweden, Marista to be precise, in 1982. And prior to this, in 1972, the Ugandan president, his name was Edi Awan, and he was convinced that South Asians were taking over his country, that they were destroying his country, and he was hell-bent on kicking them out. He gave these families 90 days to uproot their entire lives and basically get the hell out. The Hindochas were one such family and they had to move out of Uganda and after several failed attempts at asylum, they eventually found it in Sweden and that's how Annie was born there. Annie grew into a carefree woman who encouraged all those around her to just live their best life. She wanted people to sing and dance and laugh more. Her family and friends, they loved Annie. She was she was everything to them. And one thing she couldn't wait to start in her life was start her own family. She really, really couldn't wait to be married and have children and just have that perfect ending in a way. Annie was 28. She was smart. She was outgoing and she was very beautiful. She was spoiled by her parents, especially her father. When she moved to Stockholm after graduating, she um, moved there to work for the uh, mobile company Ericsson. Her father bought her a new Volvo car and a new like one bedroom apartment right in the city. And when she ordered for like thousands of dollars worth of hardwood flooring uh, for this apartment, she didn't like the old one. She didn't like the color of it. So she like ripped it out and ordered all this new flooring for this apartment. Her dad just paid for it. Like she was kind of daddy's girl spoiled. Like, I mean... Everyone says I'm a daddy's girl, but if I did that, my dad would just be like, no, <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, it's kind of crazy to just accept that kind of, you know, thing from your child to be like, daddy, I don't like it. And then you just change it. But I think it's cute. Annie, she wanted every aspect of her life to be perfect. She was like one of those people and her parents and especially her dad, they were here for it. They were like, okay. Now, when she began looking for a husband in her mid twenties, she had the same mentality. She wanted perfection. She flew regularly to London, actually, where she stayed in like homes of her wealthy family members. And this was to meet like, you know, suitable men. Her family in uh, London, they actually owned like this really well-known um, pharmacy called Wemos, I think it's called. And this family of hers, they spent a lot of their weekends like shopping and socializing and, you know, meeting with like the wealthiest of the wealthiest in London. She had made up her mind that her husband was going to be Indian and there were better prospects of this type of man in London as opposed to Sweden. One of uh, Annie's aunts in London, she actually noticed this boy named Shreyan Diwani and, you know, she would see him often at like parties in London and she approved of his like clean cut looks, his behavior, the family he came from. So a mutual acquaintance actually arranged for this aunt to get his family's phone number. And she arranged for an informal run-in between Annie and Shreyan at like a coffee bar. Now, the two of them, they really hit it off right away. And in September of 2009, they went on their first official date to watch the Lion King musical. And after this, they go on one more date to like a fancy hotel for dinner and after this date, Annie calls her sister Amy and she's like, I met a guy and I think I'm going to meet him again. Like she was really excited and she seemed to like Trian, at least at the beginning. Now, one thing they had in common was that Trian, he also, well, his family also moved to London um, from Uganda after that president was like, get out. 
And his family, the Diwanis, actually established a really successful nursing home business and they became like millionaires. Annie and Shreyan's lives were practically like the mirror images of each other, but you know, Annie's family was not as wealthy. Shreyan graduated from an elite school. He then went to the University of Manchester. He spent several months teaching English and maths in Ghana before he eventually moved back to London to work at this pres- at the prestigious accounting firm Deloitte. Within a year though, he moved um, pretty quickly into his family business to manage their healthcare business because it was doing so well. He worked at PSB Healthcare with his older brother, Priyan. Now, Shrian, Priyan and Shrian, Shrian, he wasn't even 30 and he was like a millionaire, like money, okay? Shrian, like Annie, he was like pretty popular, good looking. Now, some people state that he was a little bit too... What's the word? Like like a show off, essentially. Like he was a bit too fascinated with his own money, with his like self. And he, yeah, he liked to kind of show it off. But, you know, beneath the flashy facade of what he was, I mean, he was a millionaire. He's not going to walk around, you know, going to Target. Like obviously he's going to spend and live the way his bank account be uh, filling up, you know. But his friends, they state, like, beneath that flashy exterior, he was actually a really kind, generous, sweet guy. He had a really good sense of humor, and that's something that really drew Annie to him. She loved that they could just have fun together. They could laugh and joke and just be, like, silly together. She also loved the way that he cared for her and the way he tried to protect her. Now, a few months into their relationship, Annie was smitten. She actually gave up her job uh, in Stockholm and moved to London to be closer to him. She bought a little apartment in Luton, which was the north of London. And then that spring, Annie's parents actually traveled to London to meet Shreyan's parents. And at the time they were staying, Shreyan's parents were staying in an apartment in the city in London. Now, when Annie's parents arrived to meet them, Outside the apartment were like a fleet of luxury cars, like right, obviously belonging to the Diwanis. There were Porsches, BMWs, Mercedes, and all of them had like kind of like flashy license plates too. And uh, Annie's father, Vinod, it was the first time that he had kind of like realized the extent of their wealth, like of her, of their daughter's boyfriend's family's wealth, you know, like it was the first time he was like, dang, like. They got money, you know. He initially was a bit intimidated by, you know, the flashy display of wealth, but he quickly like dissipated that when he realized that the Diwanis were actually really kind, really nice, and warm and welcoming to him. They quickly put Vinod and his wife Nilam at ease, and it was during this visit that when um, uh, what's his name, Vinod, he approved of Annie's and Shreyan's relationship. He was like, these guys seem good. They seem like a good family and I'm here for it. Now, shortly after this meeting, um, Shreyan, he takes Annie like out to this airfield, like on a date. And at this airfield, there was a private plane just waiting for them, ready to fly them out to Paris. So they go to Paris and then they go for dinner at um, the Hotel Ritz and the waiter he pulls out this silver platter and presents it to Annie. On this silver platter was a $40,000 engagement ring, like balancing on this red rose, like holy moly. What are your guys' thoughts on um, like expensive engagement rings? Like I remember like when I was getting engaged or before I got engaged, I should say, I really thought like, yeah, that's the dream to have like this super fancy, beautiful, not fancy, but like beautiful engagement ring. Like, you know, I didn't want no cubic zirconia. Like, you know what I mean? Like I was such a little loser, but now, like now that I'm married and I have a kid and stuff, like I could care less. Like, I don't even care if it's a real diamond um, anymore. And I'm sure my husband's going to be like, why don't you tell me that, you know, before, <laughs> but um, I think it's nice, you know, because I have it and I'll keep it for my daughter or my son, you know, whatever. But I don't know. I feel like we used to place so much more importance on those kinds of things when you're younger. And that's why I'm curious what you guys think. Are you guys the same way if you're not married yet? Or even if you're married, like, is that something important to you? Leave it in the comments. Now, Vinod, he promised his 
daughter a lavish wedding. Like that was already always going to happen. He tells Annie, you know, Annie, do whatever you want to. And oh my God, like honestly, Vinod, like he seems like the sweetest dad. Like I know some people may be like, she's so spoiled, but like it's it's sweet, you know, like I don't know. I think it's nice when fathers are really like sweet to their daughters. Anyway, so the Hindochas, they weren't wealthy, obviously, like the Diwanis were. Like they were hella hella wealthy. But Vinod said that he had been saving for his daughter's wedding since she was like born. So her sister's wedding in Sweden, Amy's wedding, it had been, you know, a pretty grand affair back in Sweden. But Annie, she was like, no, I want something even bigger than that. And the Diwani family, they agreed to cover a third of the cost of the wedding. And I'm kind of like, you guys got that much money and you're going to agree to only a third like, unless they were going to provide, like, a house and stuff. But not that I'm saying it's their responsibility, but obviously these families clearly like to take care of the kids. So I'm like, wow, you're only going to cover a third of the cost. But, yeah, maybe they were going to give them, like, a house or something. So in October 2010, Annie and Shrien, they have this, like, dreamy, lavish wedding in India. It was a three-day event with lots of food, dancing, partying, drinking, and love. 300 guests attended, and I mean, it was huge. It had elephants and an altar that looked like the Taj Mahal, and my parents actually attended a wedding in India. One of their friends was Bolin, and they had this like huge wedding, and yeah, it was like three-day events, but like to tell you the like these guys weren't millionaires. They, they're pretty rich, but they weren't like this rich, I think. But I remember like when I was looking at the photos, my parents had outfits like prepared for them for each day of the wedding, except for like the actual like reception night. There were like previous days of like ceremonies or something like that. And the family paid for all the guests or whoever wanted to have these outfits provided for them with like full Indian like lavish outfits to wear to the ceremony like it was crazy they even paid for my parents hotel stay I believe yeah because not that my parents don't want to but I think that they were like no 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 we've invited you as our guests like that's what needs to be done and they provided them with a driver and everything like can you imagine this family like millionaires like it would have been even more crazy now prior to their wedding friends have said that both Annie and Shrian are pretty headstrong people who argued a lot. In January 2010, actually, Annie wanted to end the relationship, but, you know, they patched it up fairly quickly, I guess, and in a couple months after that is when she actually moved to London to be closer to Shrian. Now, when she moved to London is when she was like, okay, I really got to make this marriage or this relationship work. And behind the scenes, obviously, you know, there were still tensions and awkwardness. Shrien allegedly had abnormally low hormone levels, which would have made it difficult for him to conceive children. And, you know, Annie, obviously she wanted children. That was her dream. And the Diwani said that, you know, they were willing to get Shrien help and medical treatments to make this dream happen, even though, you know, he would he possibly would have had some uncomfortable side effects. In September of 2010, again, like, you know, nine months later, Annie again is talking about calling off the wedding. She's having her doubts again. Again, you know, they managed to patch it up and friends were just saying like, it's just normal doubts that couples have, you know, cold feet prior to a wedding. And they were like, no, these, this couple is going to make it work. Like it's not, it's not as serious as it looks to be. Every couple, you know, goes through this and it was just a normal part of, you know, having this big wedding with so much pressure and so much money involved, like, it was going to be fine. So now the wedding takes place. And then after the wedding, Shrien, he actually um, essentially plans the honeymoon um, by himself. And he plans it as a surprise for Annie. He does everything by himself. He planned to take them to South Africa. And mainly because neither of them had been there before, but also because South Africa, the initials S.A., also stood for Shrien and Annie. So S-A-S-A, -S -A, that's why they went to South Africa. So Shrien and Annie arrive at Cape Town International Airport from Johannesburg on November 12th, 2010. And once they arrive at the airport, they look for a taxi to take them to their hotel. Now, as they're looking for a taxi, Shrien captures the attention of a man 
who seemed to be driving a taxi, duh. And his name was Zola Tongo. And he was actually driving a um, VW minivan. So the two of them were going to be staying at the Cape Grace Hotel, which is one of like the most prestigious hotels in Cape Town. And, you know, Zola agrees to drive them there. So they get in Zola's minivan. They drive to the hotel. Once they get to the hotel, Annie then goes inside the hotel by herself to check in while um, Shrian, you know, and Zola are there figuring out the payment or, you know, whatever. And while they're doing that, Shrian um, then makes plans with Zola for him to come back the next day and pick them up so that they can go for dinner. Shrian requested Zola to, you know, essentially be their little tour guide while they're there and drive them around Cape Town, show them the sights, and then take them to dinner the next night. Obviously, Zola agrees. I mean, it's like steady money. And I don't think this is very unusual. Let me know your thoughts down below because whenever, especially when I used to travel with my dad, um, he always like makes friends with the driver. If he liked the driver, if he felt that, you know, the driver in that country um, could help him out and he would kind of like hire him privately in a way so that this guy can make his money, but then we also don't have to keep looking for a cab every time. And I remember we did that in Hawaii and we just had like the best time with this driver. His name was John Long. I'll never forget. He was an amazing driver. And yeah, I just think like, yeah, that's kind of like a normal thing you do. I feel like, yeah. So then the following morning, Shrian Azola arrives uh, at the hotel to take Shrian uh, somewhere to exchange money. So to exchange dollars and now it's weird like why did he go and do that when he could have literally done it at this luxury hotel i'm sure they had the facilities and then annie and shrien they spend most of the next day like by the pool just relaxing you know doing what newlyweds do they then go they get ready you know for their evening and zola he arrives back at the hotel around 7 30 p.m ready to take them to dinner so Shrian and Annie, they get into the back seat of the minivan and Zola then begins driving on this like N2 highway, which is the same highway that they came from the airport. Shrian made a reservation at a, at a hotel called 96 Winery Road, which was one of Cape Town's most like, again, like these guys like really live like most fancy restaurants. And on the way to the restaurant, however, Annie and Shrian then just decide like, we don't really want to go for like a full blown fancy dinner. Like they just weren't feeling it. Zola then offers like, all right, well, I know like another place that is more local and has really good Asian food. I could take you there. It's more downscale. It's more casual and, you know, it's more chill essentially. So if you want to go there, I'll hook you up. They agreed. And then around 9, 15 PM, he pulls off that N2 highway and he make they he drives them to this Asian place. Now the road that he pulls into is like a two lane road on like swampy lands. And they go to this restaurant, which is called the Surfside Restaurant. And it's in a resort town called Strand. And then after dinner, they go and they stroll along the beach that was close by. Around 10, 15 PM, they get back into Zola's car. And I'm like, that's a really short dinner and walk on the beach. But they were in the car from 7.30 to like 9.15. So that's like an hour and 45 minutes. So I think what Zola was doing is he was driving them around, like showing them the place maybe. And then once they get back in the car, Annie then apparently starts insisting to Shrien and the driver, like, I want to see the real Africa. Like, take me around and show me Africa, you know, like show me the real thing. And Annie then allegedly insists that Zola drive them to a raw neighborhood in Cape Town. They both then apparently decide that they want to see the other spectrum of life, which is such a typical rich person thing to say, like, my gosh, if that was said, but <laughs> okay. <laughs> so Zola then takes them to a place called Gugulathu. Now, Gugulathu was not considered a safe neighborhood and that community had seen, you know, a lot of shootings and it just wasn't a good idea for people who weren't from that town to, to go there, you know? Especially like for newlyweds, like why do you want to see that, you know? But unfortunately, um, Annie and Shrien, they learn this the hard way. So as they're driving through this neighborhood, Zola, he then suddenly halts at a stop sign. And then when Shrien looks up, he sees a man with a pistol 
right on the windshield and he's like banging on the windshield with this pistol. And, you know, this man was banging so hard that they thought like it might even break like the windshield. So the next thing Shrian knows, the men then get into the car with them, like into the passenger seat. One man goes into the back seat with Shrian and Annie with a gun and the other goes in the front passenger seat. And so they end up driving for around 45 minutes or so, just driving around, held hostage before they suddenly stopped and they ordered Shrian and Zola to get out of the car. They robbed Shrian of his money, his wallet, his designer watch and his phone. The couple, you know, begged not to be separated and to be set free instead. Instead, they forced Shrian and Zola out of the car and then they drove off into the night with Annie still with them. The last thing Shrian saw, Annie was alone with the gunman in the back seat. Zola and Shrian, they're obviously in panic now. So they go like around that neighborhood and they start like knocking on people's doors, like just begging for help. And they immediately get help from a bystander who calls the police. And the search for Annie was on immediately. So then at around 11 p.m. Uh, back in Sweden, the family phone rings of the Hindocha's house. Vinod answers and it was Prakash Dewani, who is Shrian's father. And he was calling from London and he had just spoken to Shrian. He tells Vinod, Annie's been kidnapped. Vinod says, you know, he tried to stay calm and he said, don't worry, you know, like we'll just, you know, pay them what they want. We will just go to South Africa. We will pay them what they want and we will get Annie back. We will set her free. Shrian then calls Vinod crying and he's like, I could not protect Annie. Like I couldn't, I couldn't help her. Vinod then immediately catches a flight to South Africa. And while he was on a stopover at Amsterdam, he calls his wife and as he's speaking to her, all he hears is just immense sobbing. Early the following morning at around 8 a.m., the police find the grey VW minivan. And when they found it, it had been sitting on this roadside all night. Lying across the back seat was the body of a young woman and she was completely soaked in blood. She had just been shot once at point blank range in the neck and the bullet was from a nine millimeter pistol and it had been lodged into the car seat her blood had soaked through the upholstery it seeped through the door and it was like dripping down the side of the car she had severe restraining marks which indicated that she had put up a fight and she was not sexually assaulted but all her jewelry and you know valuable items is all gone it was missing and this body was confirmed and identified to be that of Annie Diwani. Now, when Vinod arrived in Cape Town, he goes to meet Shrien. And the following day, like when he arrived, he wanted to go to the morgue to identify Annie's body with Shrien. Shrien then tells him like, oh, you actually can't go to visit her because her body, it's been all drained out. You know, if you want to see her, they have to pump liquid into her body to freshen her up. Vinod was kind of like, um, okay, like just kind of like, I can't believe you're talking about Annie like this, but okay, he agreed. But then the following day, he's like, no, I want to go identify her. So he goes to the morgue, but um, Shrian doesn't join him because he went to go get a haircut and buy a new suit. Now, from the beginning, the police knew that there was more to this investigation than meets the eye. For starters, they could not understand why Annie and Shrian would agree to go visit Gugalathu, that town, that night. It just didn't make sense. No tourists wanted to go there. Also, the driver, Zola, he knew how dangerous that neighborhood was and no one would agree to take a couple there, like especially someone who wasn't from these parts. The police were like, this couldn't just be a random you know, decision or mistake gone wrong. Like it just didn't seem right. Moreover, why did the thieves let go of Shrien and Zola? Like, why would they leave witnesses? You know, why kill only Annie but spare the other witnesses? It just didn't make sense. The police were like, they didn't shy away from killing one person. Why would they leave the others? Like the whole thing was just looking hella sus. Nothing, you know, made sense. And even the restaurant they went to didn't make sense when they had this res reservation at this really fancy place. 
And then the thieves had apparently even told Zola and Trian, um, you know, we just want the car. We don't want anything else. Then why kill Annie? And then if you wanted the car, why leave it on the side of the road? If that's all you wanted, <laughs> doesn't make sense. The case also garnered a lot of attention because it was actually affecting South Africa's tourism. The pressure on the officers working the case was pretty high and they were kind of like forced to like figure it out. You figure out what happened because this is not looking good for our country. So first when Zola was questioned as to like, why did you take these people to this town? You know, you, you're from here, you know better than that. His response was, well, they wanted to go sightseeing. Like that's where they wanted to go. And the police were then able to lift fingerprints from the vehicle which I just find so silly like if you're gonna carjack like do better but no don't because then we can't find you <laughs> now these fingerprints led them to a man and please I hope I pronounce these somewhat right to Olile Mgani and when he was confronted Olile like confessed his involvement to the killing immediately he told police you know I had an accomplice I wasn't alone and this accomplice was called Mawewe and they found him two days later and this guy's full name, oh gosh, was Ziwa Madoda Lennox Kwabe, let's call him Kwabe. He was actually Olile's neighbor and after, you know, Kwabe was arrested, he quickly admitted like, yeah, I did it. And then he would give further details about the crime. Olile said that it was Kwabe who killed Annie during the struggle for her handbag and it was along with another man called Monde Bolombo. So these three guys were basically, you know, involved in the killing of Annie. Then on November 20th, as 1500 people were gathering for Annie's memorial back in London, the police issue a warrant for a third suspect, well, technically fourth. And this was for, who can guess it before I say it? Zola Tongo, the driver. Apparently, Zola approached Monde and asked him if he knew anyone who could perform a hit. And that's when Monde put Zola in touch with the other two men, Olile and Kwabe. Well, 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 this wasn't looking out to be, you know, a random robbery like they thought. So then police were like, okay, well, how does Shrian fit into this? Because some parts of his story was just not adding up. Shrian told the cops that they, the, well, the carjackers told him they just wanted the car. They didn't want anything else. They just wanted the car. And they apparently said to him, like, we just want the car. We're not going to hurt you, but we are going to let you guys out separately. That's why it was weird that the car was also left abandoned there after killing Annie. Then when they were being robbed, Shrian states that Annie was refusing to give up her wedding and engagement rings. And that Shrian was telling her, like, don't worry, Annie, like, don't worry about it. Like, just give them everything. We can always get new stuff. Like, just give them everything and let's just get out of here. Shrian then says he handed over all the cash that he had on him. Shrian says that Annie kept screaming and crying and telling, you know, the men, like, please don't hurt us. Like, please. And that one male pointed the gun at him and said, make her shut up. Like, make her shut up because she was just making too much noise. Shrian then says Annie gave me her wedding rings. And then I then handed over all the rings, including mine, to the gunman. And he says, as soon as he, you know, handed over the rings, he said to the gunman, that's the last of what we have right now. Like, we don't have any more on us. Police, they go and they search the minivan. What do they find in the minivan? They find Annie's engagement ring hidden in the stitching of the car seat. Now, if this was a robbery the men would have been very aware of this engage engagement ring and like not forgotten to take it. And plus, Shrian said he had given the men all the rings, but the ring was hidden in the back seat, you know, like where he would have been sitting. So later when he was questioned, he admits to hiding the ring in the car seat. And again, that's so strange. Like if he's so rich, who cares about the ring, right? Like what's 40,000 to a mil millionaire, you know? So now it's Zola's turn to be questioned by the police. And this is like Zola's version. Now, I remember when he first met the couple, um, he drops them to the hotel and then Annie goes inside to check in. And then Shrian stayed back to like make plans for Zola to drive them around the next day, be their tour guide, blah, blah, blah. According to Zola, that's not all Shrian was doing. He was hiring Zola to kill his wife. He wanted it to seem like a robbery gone wrong 
and that she died in the process. Sola then claims that Trian paid him around 20,000 rands, which was like $2,600. So Zola tells Shrian like, okay, all right, like I don't have the right resources for the job, but I can find someone who can. And that person was Monde and his accomplices, uh, Kwabe and Olile. Then on the morning of the murder, Shrian goes with Zola to exchange some money, right? Zola claimed that this money exchange was to pay the assassins, the men. And Zola also states that after the murder, he met up with Shrian multiple times and CCTV footage actually fully confirms this. The police also got um, phone records and CCTV footage which corroborated um, Zola's story further. The morning after the carjack, Zola and Shrian were caught on CCTV footage at the hotel meeting up. Now, this was before Annie's body was even found. And apparently at that meetup, um, Shrian asked Zola, like, has the job been done? Then a couple of days later after, you know, Annie's body obviously was already found and, you know, she's now known as dead. Zola and Shrian meet up again at his hotel. This time, Shrian takes Zola into his hotel room. And the CCTV footage captures this, but as he's taking him into the hotel room, Shrian's holding this white envelope. Then they go in the room. We don't know what happens in the room. Then when he leaves the room and he's leaving the hotel, Zola is seen with this white envelope. Like he's leaving the hotel with the same white envelope that Shrian initially was holding when he met Zola. However, this footage only had um, video, no audio. But prior to them um, meeting in the, in the room, the first time they met after her death, it was like in the lobby area. And you can like see Shrian like looking up the CCTV footage and he's kind of just like looking around. Now, while police couldn't get a sh uh, hold of Shrian's phone, he was already back in London at this point. He actually left Cape Town just three days after Annie died. But they soon learned that he was texting Zola the entire time that they were driving in the car that night. Now, this behavior is bizarre. Why would you need to text your driver when he's right there in front of you, you know, like unless you're trying to hide something from the other person that's in the car. Making things sketchier, Shrian also changed his statement so many times that both the police and the family didn't know what to believe. Shrian's like um, timeline with Annie's family also didn't make any sense. Like everything just kept changing. Police said it was like he memorized some points, but then he didn't memorize the rest. So like the lies would fall flat. Also at Annie's funeral, which took place just five days later, his behavior was so bizarre. He apparently did not behave like a man who was grieving or mourning his newly wed wife's death. He had been really cold and controlling and he apparently said to his father, like, my shoulders are so stiff, I need a massage. And he planned the funeral, like the entire funeral on a spreadsheet and he wanted to be the one in charge of everything. He also apparently didn't have any respect for Annie's like dead body because when um, they were putting bangles on Annie's wrists, he apparently was so like rough with her wrist, like he was shoving the bangles on her arm. And only when someone said something, I think it was her sister or something like made a comment, like what the hell are you doing? You're being so rough. He claimed he was suffering from, you know, PTSD and depression. Soon Zola, okay, agrees to a plea deal to testify against Shrian. He agreed to serve 18 years in prison. However, um, you know, spoiling the story, in June this year, he was actually granted parole and released. But this plea deal allowed South African authorities to get a warrant for Shrian's arrest, who was already back in London at this point. But Shrian, he didn't even seem like he was interested in the investigation. Like he was just ready to move on with his life. He was kind of over it. So in the meanwhile, the other men's trials actually just moved on and proceeded without Trian. And it was concluded that it was Kwabe was the one who actually shot and killed her, which is what they said in the first place. And the rest of the men were indicted as just being involved in the crime. So sentencing was as follows. Kwabe got 25 years in prison. Monde Malombo, he got full immunity for just cooperating, you know, with the investigation because he was not actually there that night. He was the one that suggested the hitman, you know. Olile didn't um, get a plea deal and he actually got a life sentence, uh, life in prison. But in 2014, he died of a brain tumor. And, you know, back at home, the Hindojas claimed that Shrian was extremely disrespectful to Annie, Annie's family, and um, 
his own family. He was angry that people mourned for her and she was getting so much attention. And then for some reason, he didn't want any of that. Like he didn't want Annie to have any attention. And then about a month later, he actually was arrested based on that warrant. He was arrested in London based on that South African warrant, but he was able to easily make bail. I mean, he could afford it. And at this point, Annie's family is desperate for answers. Like, what is the truth? What happened? They were devastated by the situation and just needed some closure. Like just to know, like, did their daughter just die for no reason? Their once happy lives, like nearly perfect lives, just suddenly started to take a massive turn and a toll on the family. Now, Shrian's family then hired a PR agent to divert from all the negative press he was receiving. After all, it was affecting, you know, their family business. And the agency portrayed him as this grieving, loving husband who could just not cope with what had happened to his wife. Now, however, shortly after this PR thing came out, and I'm guessing people get pissed when people are portrayed in the media, maybe as not who they truthfully are, or who knows, or just people want the limelight. But shortly after this PR stunt move, um, a male sex worker came out and opened up about his relationship with Shrian. He claimed that Shrian was secretly gay and had been having relations with him, but obviously Shrian and his family strongly deny these claims. Then a profile from a website called Gaydar was released, Shrian's profile, and Shrian describes himself on the profile as a submissive, filthy-minded, and perverted individual. He used the name Asian Subguy as his, like, username, and, you know, he can claim that you know, it wasn't him. Somebody made this account, fake account of his, but he actually accessed this account two days into his honeymoon. Uh, sorry, two days prior to Annie's death on his honeymoon. So in South Africa. So now he was a member of Gaydar from 2004 up until a week after Annie's death, where he then deactivated that account. Like, honestly, who cares if he was gay or bisexual or whatever his sexual preferences were? It's sad if he feels or felt like he needed to hide it. Maybe he felt this intense pressure coming from this huge wealthy family. He needed to have this certain, you know, image. Now, Annie's parents believe when this was released that this was his motive to kill Annie. His double life would be exposed. Maybe Annie found out. Maybe, you know, Shrian decided to kill Annie rather than face the humiliation this would bring to him and his family, the humiliation of a divorce, you know, that's really strong in some families. They don't agree with that. Annie's family then started to like put the pieces together, like family, even like extended family, cousins, friends, started to put the pieces together, like all these signs prior to them getting married. They, you know, started to claim like maybe the couple wasn't happy. Annie would call her sisters, her cousins, her friends crying and saying, you know, she didn't want to marry um, Shrian. He was too controlling about petty things like her not folding the clothes or eating ice cream in bed or being messy just really like petty things. But you know, like they said prior, they just believe that this was cold feet. And you know, the things would settle down once they got married, which guys, if you ever just have doubts about marrying someone, don't marry someone. Even just like being in a relationship with someone, don't do it. Like your gut feeling sometimes is real. It's real. So in March, 2011, the English justice system basically said, yo, Shireen, you got to get back to South Africa. You have to face these charges. So they wanted to extradite him to South Africa, but Shireen's lawyers fought this saying his mental health was just not at the right state. It's not right to send him. He's got, you know, suicidal thoughts. He's going to harm himself. So they won this appeal and he wasn't sent until his health, you know, mental health was going to improve. Then, you know, time came again and then time came again. But he successfully used this reason twice, fought two more appeals and avoided going, like being extradited. Then in 2014, four years after Annie's murder, Shrian was like, couldn't fight it anymore. The court was like, you get your ass over there. He was extradited to South Africa. He, you know, obviously pled not guilty to all the charges against him. And the prosecution was like, no. Shrien organized all this because he was secretly gay and he didn't want to risk any of this coming out. Prosecution argued that, you know, Shrien was secretly gay and he married Annie because of societal pressures and his culture had frowned upon divorces. Maybe Annie found out about this. Maybe he wanted to just be gay and live his life. So he killed his wife. They presented so much evidence against Shrien, like his phone records, testimonies, CCTV footage, his frequently um, like visited websites, which included like gay dating, porn sites, everything was gay. Like everything that he was accessing on these like websites was gay related. So it fed to that 
reason. The prosecution, you know, also argued that Annie wasn't happy in the marriage with Shrien and she had actually sent multiple texts to family and friends stating that it was probably a mistake to have married him. And these texts were also sent on her honeymoon. The defense argued that no, Shrien's not gay, he's bisexual, and his sexual orientation has nothing to do with it because it didn't affect his love for Annie. The defense also pointed out that white envelope that Shrien gives Zola in the hotel for his services. The defense states that that envelope was for his driving services, not for anything else, not what you guys are thinking. The defense also states it's ridiculous that Shrian, you know, asked this random taxi driver um, or driver to murder his wife and that this driver agrees. But the prosecution was like, no, it's actually not that wild because these people, you know, if, if you find someone that's poor enough that needs the money, they, they're going to be willing to do anything. And why wouldn't Shrian hire like a multimillionaire, why wouldn't he hire or use the hotel's car services than going and just finding some random driver at the airport? Several newspapers also um, alleged that the police tortured those four men, the um, the co-conspirators, to like confess to Shrien being the mastermind. And this was because the World Cup was happening sh um, shortly and everyone was only talking about Annie's death, how unsafe South Africa was. And apparently the South African police at the time were like, known notoriously for committing these kinds of like acts. In the end, the defense painted that Zola was actually the true mastermind behind this crime, that he was looking for money and that the men were intelligent and smart enough and crude enough to come up with Shrien being the mastermind. They're hoping that they would get lesser sentences, even though they were the ones that killed her. Two months later into the trial, the case was dismissed and Shrien walked free. He didn't even have to take the stand. He didn't have to like be questioned and Annie's family was crushed. They couldn't believe that despite the CCTV footage, like the testimonies, the text messages, the basically all the evidence mounting up against Shrian that he was allowed to go. Just bye, he's free. They wanted justice for their daughter, her death, and they felt super let down. Now, Annie's family actually also got a British coroner to verify like the autopsy results, but this coroner ended up just agreeing with the South African coroner's results anyways. And there was like no further evidence to try and like pin more on Shrian or anything, nothing else to basically help the case. Annie's family also filed a complaint against the South African judge in this trial saying, why was Shrian not even asked to take the stand? Like, why was this case dismissed so quickly like they were just not happy with it however the court found no foul play and actually cleared this judge again of all charges now you know annie's family is pushing itself to get over the grief and just move on in life but they find it super difficult to move on if they don't even know like what happened they're not really getting closure they know the men who you know did it but if Shrian was was involved they want justice for that now as for Shrian, he's moved on with his life very clearly and he's actually been seen with um a brazilian male photographer um a couple of years ago i believe and it's alleged or believed that it is his boyfriend and he doesn't seem to be hiding it now which i'm happy for him i feel like you know you shouldn't have to hide that but i'm also sad that there's no justice really annie's death got a lot of attention in terms of the media so much so there's a few documentaries and books about it i believe and um during these interviews with the murderers they actually opened up about how devastated they felt about committing this crime and stuff like this I mean you know for a bit of money I understand they get desperate and these foreigners they feel like they're never going to be connected but such huge mistakes and so many lives ruined I only just thought about this now but like the case being dismissed and stuff like that like what if Shrian's family or Shrian paid off the judge you know, like I never thought about that before because, yeah, it just doesn't make sense why it was dismissed so quickly and they weren't even trying to investigate further into it. You know what I mean? They, went, they were just like, nah, he's just didn't do it. Like, see you later, Shane. Go back, go back, go back to London. You know, like, it just doesn't seem right. Imagine being on your honeymoon and this happening. If Annie really felt like Shran wasn't the one for her, imagine her panic in the car while this was happening to her. If, you know... Shrian wasn't like the loving, caring husband, you know, like you would normally look to your partner for support in a moment of stress like that. And I'm sure she kind of did, but like, imagine then being alone, he's let out of the car. I'm sure she was sus. And then she gets shot. Like, oh my God, she really must've been terrified. And I really, really feel sorry for Annie's family too. She seemed like such a daddy's girl and her parents seemed like lovely people. 
And like her father Vinod's statements about Annie and about his life with Annie are so heartbreaking, so heartbreaking. I mean, the question is not if Shrian is gay. The question is, did he have his wife of three weeks killed? Who's telling the truth? Why kill her? I understand divorce would have caused like a ruckus in the family, but then wouldn't a murder have as well? Like, yeah, you you're, you being gay wouldn't come out, but didn't he think that a murder investigation was going to reveal some things? Like he was going to be a suspect, but... I guess they don't think that far ahead. So let me know your thoughts on this case down below, guys. I hope you found this one interesting. I hope Annie's family can, you know, get some peace in the near future. Hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next one, guys. Besitos. Bye.